Funds are functional objects. They're, they were made not because numismatists could study them 2000 years later. Yeah. They were made because they had a function. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are aspects to it which we tend to over interpret, which might be just functional, like, you know, purely functional aspects. Such as? Such as mm, shape. I would imagine, so I would, I would say uh, some coins are square, some coins are round. Yeah. And, you know, uh, in certain cases, people find, found uh, them to make, you know, manufacture square coins more easier than round ones mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And in that particular aspect, it becomes a kind of coinage tradition that people, you know, get used to that kind of shape or size or whatever. One thing is absolutely sure that people tend to uh, uh, trust coinage, which is part of a tradition rather than an innovation. Right. So there's always this dynamic between innovation and tradition uh, that comes into force when you talk about coin design. Mm -hmm. I mean like you know, you, you know that your um, 500 rupee note is green mm -hmm. for the time being and you certainly find a red 500 rupee note, you would not trust it. Yeah. So this is something that is a kind of the, the element of human psychology of trust that prompts, uh, that plays a, a lot in terms of coin design and how coins look like mm -hmm. and how the coins are issued. So, for example, we know that uh, even when the, when the Turks arrived and they, they had a completely different coinage tradition, which was an, uh, an entirely inscriptional coinage, entirely inscribed in a script that was not current in India, they could not actually you know, change the coinage in India overnight. Yeah. There was a period of transition where they struck coins in Indian scripts mm -hmm. with Indian depictions. You know. So, there is this, this kind of adjustment that mm -hmm. And we, uh, a lot of times we tend to um, uh, sort of not think about it, you know, that, that this is a functional aspect. They did not want, want their coins to be dis, dis, you know, uh, distrusted. They didn't have, lack of trust would mean that they would be discounted yeah. and they would lose value. Right. So they don't, they don't want that. They, they want, if you're issuing coins, you want to make as the issuer of coins the best use of it. Yeah, you don't want to let them be discounted and somebody else pick the the discount, uh, you know, out. That that actually impinges on your exactly. income. Yeah. So you know, I I tend to think that there are people who look at coins and they think that a particular coin has been issued in a particular way because there is a message in it. Mm -hmm. And I I I regard them as the the, the ones which are kind of propagandists. Mm -hmm. So they they see propaganda in everything uh, that a coin is carrying. And then there are other people who say, no, hang on a minute, there is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's an entirely functional thing. So then those are the functionalists. And the truth actually sort of lies somewhere in between. Uh, not all coin or all, not all money imagery is all about propaganda. It, it, it is sometimes about propaganda, but not always. You know, there, is, there are various aspects to it. There are functional aspects, there are sort of contemporary aspects, you know, the kind of ethos that you live in. They all get reflected in 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 individual depictions. Uh, all all we have uh, as evidence are facts. You know, uh, they are factors. But when you actually tend to put the facts together and create uh, an ideologically understandable, uh, you know, um, concept out of it. Uh, it might not be true. Yeah. So, so finding truth is something that I don't want to do. I want to actually learn about how that construct can be achieved. Yeah. And that is what I think that uh, we should look at uh, the past as. You know, not, not, not with the finding whether something happened on uh, 15th of June or 16th of June. That really is not that significant. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the, the entire thing, the entire aspects that happened around it, to make it happen. I don't want to think all the 16th century. Right. That is far more interesting. It was uh, Benedito Croce who said that all history is contemporary history. You know, mm -hmm. you know, sort of, and people tend to think, take that in a cynical way. Like, oh you know, well, what's the point? You know, uh, because you have only finite evidences and what you do is, uh, is just, you know, it's your own interpretation and as much as, uh, you know, it's your own imagination in a way. It's, 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 it's historical imagination. You have a license to it as a historian. That's fine. But at the same time, it's 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 basically what you, what 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 your conceptualization of it is. It's, it's never the the truth. Yeah. And it's never the reality as such. And 
I find that uh, quite interesting because you know people do tend to essentialize uh, categories. I mean, uh, um, this whole thing about you know Greeks in India is is a complete uh, essentialist kind of thing. It completely talks about othering Greeks, whatever they are, from Indians, whatever they are again. And uh, it's it's a it's a kind of twentieth century construct, really. And one then one finds uh, very interesting things like you know James John Marshall, who is the very Taxila, who who created this whole concept of uh, the two sides at Taxila. Uh, one was the the Birman and one was the Sirka. And uh, these two sides were considered one was sort of free Greek, mm-hmm. all 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 piggledy piggledy, all 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 you know hodgepodge kind of side and. Uh, Sirka was, uh, you know, organized and you know, uh, great plan. And so, obviously, the implication was that uh, 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 the, uh, the Greeks were a uh, kind of civilizing influence on mm-hmm. on the, the pre-Greeks, whoever they were. So this was seen to be the making of the Indo-Greek kind of civilization. And then you have the class stories of, you know, Buddhas wearing these kind of robes, which have, you know, the folds of, you know, are articulated in a Greek fashion. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is fascinating is that uh, although they were articulated in a Greek fashion, the people who actually, when this art flourishes, the Greeks are long gone. The, the Greeks don't actually live there forever. Mm-hmm. They, they, they are there for a hundred years. Then we don't really know. I mean, they are obviously using Greek. But the, 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 the time they come into contact with the uh, uh, mainland subcontinent, so the time after they cross the Hindu Kush mountains and come into what was Andhara or India at that time, they come across a whole set of different cultures, practices, languages, scripts, whatever. And they sort of adopt. Mm-hmm. And then in this kind of intermixture, this has been a knotty kind of debate about how Greek were Greeks in this region. They obviously claim some sort of Greek uh, legacy, but were they really Greek? Were they, did they intermarry? You know, what was their racial composition? What was exactly Greek about it? And Greek as a, a kind of a you know as a kind of polemic notion is a, is a different thing that you can discuss. But was it was there anything more than that? Were, were there racial Greeks? Yeah. Were there ethnically Greeks? You know, and how did they see themselves? You know, all these kind of questions are quite open for interpretation. They were thought to be uh, these kind of you know uh, descendants of yeah. Western people, and obviously everything which was beautiful, everything which was realistic, everything which was you know, true to life, everything which was informed, mm. everything which was uh, uh, analytical was all Western. Mm. And things which were not that, mm. things which were simple, things which were arcane, things which were, uh, you know, which did not use script, you know, things which were of the mind rather than of the of, of, of the object, really, were all interesting. Mm. So this this was kind of this dichotomy that was created by Eurocentric scholars. And of course, in the colonial perspective, of course, uh, it, it, it also meant that whatever was Indian was somehow lower mm-hmm. than whatever was Greek, which was somewhat higher. Mm-hmm. And it was this kind of looking down on the Greek, uh, on the Indian thing, is, is is the story that we find constantly. And this is this is precisely how the entire evidence was interpreted. Right. They, you know, there, there's a whole set of coins that were found in Taxila, mm-hmm. which is a famous Greek site next to this lava dam. Um, which were which betrayed all the Indian characteristics. They were, you know, as I said, they were uninspired. They were, they were square. They, they they did not have realistic depiction. So they were considered Indian, and they were sort of consigned to a period before the Greek, mm-hmm. because after the Greeks, of course, this changes, mm-hmm. and inscriptions start appearing, realism starts appearing, and before that, everything was symbolic and schematic. You know, so that was all Indian. And uh, now actually we have evidence to suggest that this, this kind of schematic and symbolic coinage and the Greek coinage, which was realistic and with inscriptions, etc., were actually circulating and in parallel mm-hmm. for about a hundred years. Mm-hmm. So this whole narrative yeah. of uh, creating a separate uh, bracket into yeah. which these these sort of Indian coins could be placed uh, disappears. There, yeah. there, there is no evidence to that. Yeah. So, and that in now, if you see, when you look about why was that particular that it was created? It was created because they had to fit this set. Mm-hmm. And that fitting in compartments was informed by their own understanding of history. If you go to the excavation reports that Marshall himself published, for mm-hmm. example, uh, you, 
you can see clearly that uh, 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 there is, you know, what they consider as Greek art or Greek influence is actually coming in first century AD when there were no Greeks there, there, there were Scythians. Yeah. And these Scythians were supposedly barbarians, supposedly nomadic people. Hi and thanks for checking out Artist Story with PK. My name is Paritosh and I created this channel in order to share content with you on the cultural past of India and our world. If you like what you see, please go ahead and share, subscribe and check out my other social media profiles. And if you have any comments on the content I create, any questions, please go ahead and reach out to me.